Thank you everyone for, for joining this webinar today. We're really, really excited. Um, and you know, for the sake of time, we can go ahead and get started. This will also be recorded. So anyone that's not able to join will have access to it. Um, but first for some intros, uh, my name is Madison Kamek. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the senior customer success manager here at All Voices. Um, if you're not familiar with All Voices, we are an anonymous employee feedback management platform. Uh, so we enable employees to share feedback, ask questions, raise concerns uh, directly to leadership. And then company admins get access to insights and data to help them take proactive steps to improve company culture um, and understand employee sentiment. Uh, so for today's conversation, we're super excited to dive into feedback, um, what it means to encourage proactive engagement. Um, we know that building an outstanding culture is really a moving target. Um, and we're really excited to chat with these experts today and get their take on, on what this looks like in 2022 and beyond. Uh, we'll also leave some time at the end for questions, so please feel free to put those in the Q&A uh, button in the bottom, um, and we'll make sure to, to get to as many of those as we can. So thank you all to these panelists, really excited to, to chat with you all today, and I will let them now introduce themselves. Um, so we'll start with Rustin, um, if you could give you a quick introductory of your name, your pronouns, and your area of expertise. Yeah, certainly. Thank you for having me. So Rustin Richburg, I uh, am the Chief People Officer with Bark, a, a dog-focused company. My pronouns are he and him. And my area of expertise, really my background's been in a, a combination of, of strategy, uh, consulting, and uh, human capital uh, space. So really kind of marrying those together. Uh, typically in a consumer or customer facing uh, company such as Bark or Walmart um, or other consumer goods. So wonderful to be here. Um, and we'll go to Christina next. Hi everyone, Christina Rivard. My pronouns are she, her. Um, and I work for TrueCar as a senior director of people. I'm always a little bit leery about the term expert. I feel that I am a lifelong learner um, and happen to end up in the world of HR because I think people are the most fascinating problems out there. Um, I have been at Target, at Riot Games, and now at TrueCar, and I tend to focus on efforts that are a little bit more green space with a high degree of change management, and really that intersection between business strategy and HR initiatives. Um, so that's me. I love that, Christina. Um, and so my, my area of focus is um, diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. I'm Aisha Loesch and I'm the SVP of equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging at Hill Holiday. Um, and my pronouns are she, I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Great to, to have you all. Um, so I would love to start the conversation with really defining what proactive engagement is. So what that looks like to you and how you can bring that to an organization. Um, let's start it with Aisha. You know, proactive engagement from, you know, from our lens is really around ensuring that you're having opportunities for your, for your talent and your folks to be able to engage with you all the time. And so it's not just during annual reviews. It's not just during, um, you know, end of year parties. It's really about having consistent um, daily conversations and dialogue around what's happening um, and making sure folks have the transparency to see what's happening across the organization and get engaged where they feel best. So if that's our business resource groups, or if that's, you know, just talking to our executive leadership, we want to ensure that they have the opportunity. So it's not about waiting for something to happen. It's around kind of being on the offensive. I would define it best as. Um, I can jump in and add too. I think the piece that's been really interesting as we've been navigating the pandemic here is how we do this when we can't see people physically. Right, so this proactive piece is even more important in our day to day and being really deliberate in how we do that. Um, and I think the piece that really has to come through effectively is this genuine curiosity of how are you? Not the superficial, you're standing in the line at the supermarket, how are you? But like the genuine, no, how are you? 
And what can I do? What's one thing I can do to make, you know, your day better or your week better or, you know, your time here at whatever company better. Um, so this, this piece of being able to rely on surveys because you could take a pulse just by walking the office floor is no longer. Um, you have to find ways to um, reach out to people and genuinely understand like how are they doing so that you can then address things versus waiting for an explosion to happen. It's so true. Uh, um, Aisha and, and Christina, th those points. Um, the, the framework that I often use with our leadership team and with our managers is listening, insights, and action. And at a enterprise level, we can systemize that and we can use tools for it. But Christine, to your point of you know standing in line, water cooler, or a Zoom call, having that opportunity to ask great questions, to shut up and listen. Um, your insights don't have to be sophisticated, um, but they do need to be proactive in nature and that you're conscious about making those, those insights and then taking action. Um, you know, we're, we're not just uh, sharing things to share things, our employees don't. Um, we want there to be meaning there and we want to be able to take some level of action and it might be little things um, and it might be bigger things that go with it. But I, I think about that listening insights and action and plus one to the other points. Awesome. And so tying that a little bit into company culture, um, we know culture can be really hard to measure and is a ever moving target. Um, what is one thing, and I'll go to Christina on this one, um, that you would tell a company to track or focus on who's just getting started on building out or enhancing their culture? Yeah, I love this, this question. So, you know, culture happens whether or not we, we deliberately do anything. You know, this is the language that we choose. It's the policies that we use. It's who we recognize, who we don't recognize, who's sitting at the table, who's not sitting at the table. It's every little decision that we make throughout the day. So whether you have a deliberate focus on what do I want my culture to be or, um, or not, it exists, right? So, um, and, and the piece that I would say is particularly for companies that are just starting out, it's so much easier to manage in the beginning than it is later, right? So I'll use a little sailing analogy. Uh, a sunfish is like a small, uh, small little sailboat that you, you know, most kids, if they're gonna learn how to sail, they start out on that. It's two people on it versus the Titanic. It's way easier to maneuver um, when you're the size of a sunfish than the ti Titanic, right? So. It's going to happen whether you do it or not. Um, your teams are going to define, you know, how they interact with each other. Um, and a really good culture is not um, a cookie cutter approach of, hey, I read that, you know, this big company is doing this, or this well-respected company does this, or this, um, you know, not so respected company does this. So we want to avoid that thing, right? Um, good culture is really the alignment of all of those things the, that um, your team does in a day-to-day -day basis to serve your business, right? To, to meet your business objectives. So being really in tune with what is the purpose first um, of whatever it is that you're doing uh, is critical. So then you can say, what am I, what do I need to measure? How do I move forward? Um, and you know, as people are starting out, you don't have to recreate the wheel. There's a lot of good research in this space. And we know the number one thing that really describe, um, drives that discretionary effort for people is engagement. That's how we kind of quantify it, right? So whether it's Gallup or another um, resource or vendor out there, there's a lot of um, tools that can help you kind of get a baseline of where am I today? Um, so, you know, I, I guess I would say don't recreate the wheel. Don't try to ask every question, you know, to go back to Rustin's point earlier. If you're going to ask a question, you should be prepared to ask, act on that question. 
Um, and if you're not comfortable or you don't have resources to act on it, it's probably not the right time to ask the question just for asking sake, because that's how you start to build trust with your employee base is ask the question, demonstrate that you're listening, get curious, and then have solid follow through. And then ask the question again, so that you have consistency over time so that you can see, are we moving things in a positive direction? And how are people showing up as a result? And how does that tie back to our business objectives or not? Um, yeah. I, love, I, I would just add a, 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 an antidote from my experience here with Bark. I haven't been with Bark too terribly long, just over for a year now. And I mentioned in my introduction, we're, we're dog crazy company. We're, our, our mission is super simple, make dogs happy. And that permeates through the entire organization. It's like the first question we ask any recruit. And I didn't fully recognize how important that mission alignment combines with the culture, combines with the individual joining the company. And it's just been beautiful. Um, you know, a bunch of dog crazy people here. Um, but we're really focused around the mission and the, uh, the, the, the underpinnings of the, the company uh, in that context. And um, it's something I'll take with me as like a great case study and example of where you really bring that mission to life it permeates the culture and the people really resonate and connect with it. Don't always get it right 100% of the time, but you've got really a great spine to work from. Yeah, Rustin, and to that end, you know, people need something to, to work towards, and that's how they feel seen and heard. And so if the person is the receptionist or they're the CFO, they need to understand what they're going working towards each day and having that drive and feeling engaged and included in the overall mission of the Titanic or the Sunfish. <laughs> you know, are they putting up the sail? Are they putting coal in the engine? You know, whatever it is, folks need to understand that we're trying to get to our end destination. And I love your mission, you know, make dogs happy, you know, whatever that is across all organizations, you have to ensure that you have those opportunities um, for talent to fully understand that and it's in every piece of what you do. So as a takeaway, I think that's extremely important because what is also the flip side of that is hearing that negative feedback and hearing where I don't feel connected to the culture or I don't understand what the mission is to take that as an opportunity to um, make some changes. Um, because negative feedback is what helps us to stay on our, you know, as we talked about being proactive, staying proactive, knowing what's going to be um, where we have some challenges and ensuring that we're we're listening to our talent. And I think Christina, you mentioned this as well, and Rustin, I think we're, I'll repeat it one more time just so folks know, you have to take action. And even though you may not be able to take action in that moment, let's say it's something much larger than, um, than what you were expecting, creating a plan. Is it over three quarters? Is it over three years? Being transparent mm -hmm. about that, hearing the talent and say, I know this is a problem and we're going to address it in these ways because we have, you know, there's resources, there's financial things that have to come into play when you're making all these decisions. But I think even when talent hears that you heard me, there's a plan. And, you know, and there'll be touch points throughout either, either, either through all voices or eat whatever it is, ensuring that talent knows what's happening, I think is, is huge for kind of all of those things to come together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love that. Yeah, I, I really love that you said kind of making sure that they're feeling seen and heard. Um, and I know you kind of touched a little bit on kind of what that negative feedback is like. Um, but we'd love to hear, Aisha, from you, um, how can a company or, you know, HR teams or people teams best handle that negative feedback, whether that's sharing that to leadership or responding to a really upset employee? Um, what's the best way for companies to kind of handle that really difficult uh, feedback? And again, we all have these like, shut up and listen it might be, you know, shut up and dance was a hit tune, but that might be the next one to trend <laughs> on the billboard music trend. Um, because that's huge. Active listening um, is such an important part of the negative feedback piece. It's not having a, well, did you see this email or what did you participate in that focus group? It's not a place to go tit for tat. It's a place to listen, reflect, 
and then again, come back with a plan. Um, so is it telling to senior leadership, hey, this is what's happening? Is it going to department heads and say, I've heard this a few times from different employees, let's sit down. Is it conflict resolution workshop? Is it you know, an opportunity to pulse the folks to see how they're feeling? Is it a psychologically safe space? You know, Having all these different uh, nuances to be able to triage what you've heard of the negative feedback and then make the change. But I think it's definitely um, extremely important to listen and not to come back with forwarded emails of things the person may have missed because that just makes them feel, um, at least let me speak for myself, it makes me feel that you didn't hear me and you're just going back to rote things. Like what is the opportunity for us to maybe even be more effective with the things that you forwarded to me. So the next person in, on, on the, in, in the industry or the company or in the agency or the team doesn't feel the same way that I'm feeling. I, one of the wor uh, words of advice that I got uh, from one of the best leaders I worked with, uh, she was at Walmart, 33 year veteran um, of the company. And anytime we would have our listening session, she would always start with this little phrase, which was, Feedback is a gift. And I would add, without a return receipt. Um, so <laughs> you're, you're getting this. And if you do go in with that context, Asia, that you had there of the, you know, there's so much value that comes from when someone is opening themselves up and, and sharing. And you may not be able to solve it in the moment. Um, it may be three quarters or three years out. Um, the thing, though, of, of taking, acknowledging and, you know, talking to a human like a human and uh, being real and, tr you know, as transparent as, as humanly possible here is the real, I think, secret. Because oftentimes we raise things or we, we have employees that raise things and some things we can solve, some things, you know, maybe the context has gotten out of whack a little bit or maybe we can explain things a bit better or in a different way. And maybe some things, you know, you explain in, you know, you've got two diverging opinions, but that that's fine as well. So long as they've both been out and they've both been heard and you move forward. The thing that really I find is a big place where people don't feel heard, don't feel seen. It shows up in disengagement, destructive behavior, leaving the company, you know, a whole host of things can come from it is when we sweep things under the rug. You know, we, we pretend that we've got must have the world's largest rug and we just keep sweeping things under it and it gets lumpy. It gets, uh, you know, unbearable. Um, and it goes back to that conversation we were having about culture. It's not the culture any of us want to be with a lumpy rug. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And the theme, too, that I hear in all of this is really around empathy. Right. Mm -hmm. And that multiple truths can be true at the same time, right? So that employee can have had that experience and you could have had, you know, sent that email or that communication, right? And so having empathy for the lived experience of that employee of, well, what is it that's blocking individuals from being able to consume that information? Is it because they don't have bandwidth to read it? Is it because um, they didn't understand it? Is it because they don't believe it? Like there's more to the story. And so when you show up and you're genuinely curious about that individual's experience and walking in kind of their shoes, you gain a lot more because it's likely that they're not the only person that is feeling it. They're just the person that was brave enough to say something and, um, you know, how you receive that feedback will then ensure that that person is going to show up again and give feedback. Now, I've also seen some pretty toxic, um, you know, a little like below the belt kind of feedback come through where you're like, wow, like we are on the same team. Um, and I think that even how you maneuver through that and rise above it can help lower the temperature and even have that individual self-reflect and say, hmm, I was probably too harsh and I apologize for that. And they show up differently and they tell their coworkers and they tell their friends and more people will raise their hands. I always say it's you know, when you have those vocal people that stop raising their hands and stop speaking up, those are your canary in the coal mine. 
right? Like if you have that person, you know, there's always somebody that'll raise their hand that has the question when they stop asking questions, when they stop providing feedback, both positive and, and constructive, that sh- alarm bells should go off. So you want that. You want to know that people feel safe enough to, to raise their hand. I love that. Yeah, that's a great way to kind of think about it. And, and the whole kind of theme around listening. I would love to hear, uh, Rustin, from you first, um, thinking about trends and mistakes that we've seen. You know, over the last couple of years, we've seen Zoom fatigue develop and survey fatigue um, what are some ways to engage employees that you've seen work well? Um, and what things have you seen fall flat? Yeah, I think the overarching theme is none of us had figured it out completely and it will continue to evolve. So in that context, um, the things that I've really seen that um, are working really, really poorly, but then the flip side does give us some level of hope is around flexibility. So, uh, you know, previously, whether we were five days of the week in the office, um, you know, as we responded into the the pandemic and it was, we're doing a company-wide Zoom call every morning at 8 a.m. or what have you. What we're finding now, or at least I'm finding in the conversations I'm having is giving, you know, maybe maybe it's a framework and flexibility within that framework but choose your own adventure is really helping people to create the solutions that are working right for them. And also setting the context that, or or the expectation rather, that it doesn't always have to be that way either, because we've also learned, uh, you know, over the past two years that what we said on Monday probably is going to change by Friday Um, and allowing people that, you know, during the summer, it might look this way and the winter, it might be this way and the spring, it might be this way. And they've got the flexibility. Now that does put more burden on us um, as managers and leaders of clear expectations Um, setting um, great feedback routines um, and understanding our people and their needs. Basic, you know, great management skills, but maybe things that we didn't overly invest in in the past that we really have to invest in now. So what I've seen things that work really, really well is when we invested in the manager, gave them tools, frameworks, ideas, and then helped them experiment and trial and fix and change and adjust as they went through. That's what I've said. I'd be very interested to learn from Christina and Aisha as well of like, what can I do better? Mm -hmm. I love that. You arming folks and giving folks access to resources and training is so important. I think we, over the years as as corporations, you know, training, learning and development sometimes went to the wayside, but it's so important, especially in this hybrid space that a lot of us haven't been in. I know, Christina, we were talking about earlier, there's always been some folks that have always been remote, but it, it, they hadn't been included in the offices in the same way. And so the things that folks have to definitely realize after you give them those resources and as we go into this hybrid space is things around like proximity bias. You can't just look out down the hall and be like, oh, I want to give this person an opportunity. You have to really sit down, as Rustin was saying, and ensuring that we're looking at all of our talent equally, equitably, ensuring that opportunities are being shared. Um, And then, you know, things that may not be as fun anymore are happy hours. They were happy um, at one time, but joining a Zoom happy hour after being on other Zooms for, you know, nine other hours and having the flexibility to be outside gratefully again and slowly, you know, inching our way back to um, safely integrating some of our favorite activities and seeing our favorite people has kind of fallen flat, as you mentioned, <laughs> Madison, in your intro there. So, you know, really pulsing your talent, ensuring that maybe that might work for one team, giving other people opportunities to potentially uh, engage uh, in person if that's something that seems fit for those folks and making it okay, giving folks the autonomy and the understanding. I know we like to say that we're all adults, but there is some type of nuance and behaviors that people see, well, if my whole team is going, I can't be the only person. Yes, you can. It is okay. Articulate what your needs are, set your boundaries. And I think those are going to be extremely helpful as we navigate kind of figuring out what this looks like. But to Rustin's point, we don't know all the answers quite yet, but we have seen an evolution of being on a happy hour at four o'clock and being really stoked about it to being on a happy hour at four o'clock now 
and potentially just not joining. So um, I think there's definitely opportunity there for us to continue to figure out that hybrid. And I think technology is gonna have a huge place in that. Um, mm -hmm. If you are gonna have folks in the office, ensuring that the folks who are dialing in have the same, or at least a higher quality of, um, of engagement as opposed to, we all remember polycom days of, hi, who joined and trying not seeing people or not understanding who's there, just making sure that they're just as excited to be part of that hybrid virtual space as well, I think is going to be a huge trend we'll see more, um, more focus in as we go forward. Yeah, this question is super fascinating because we certainly don't have all of the answers for it yet. And I think our future selves will look back and, there's a lot of case studies to be had here, but you know, one of the things I think about is the rise of, of the culture around, you know, people being co-located in the, the tech world and particularly and in startups and this, you know, we need everybody to be sitting next to each other um, and we're gonna bring amenities to our campus so that people are here, that they feel taken care of, and you end up staying there longer, your social network ends up coming from work um, and people don't have a lot that exists outside of the day to day. And that was a, I can speak from, you know, my time at my prior employer at Riot Games, like we have beautiful campus in West LA here. Um, it served breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We had a coffee bar, smoothie bar, PC bong, like, it was, you know, a, a basketball court, like people didn't leave and their best friends were there. And then we're all, you know, went into lockdown in March, 2020. And we needed the happy hours to your point, because we felt so our, our, our work friends were our life friends and we needed them. They were our lifeline to, you know, the outside world when we were all batting down the hatches. And I'll be curious to see how this evolves over the course of time, you know, as we watch some of these big organizations um, in California and around the world figure that nuance out and that balance of hybrid and um, what role does the company play in um, making connections and being the place where you build friendships versus people having friendships really outside of the workplace too. I think it's too early to know, but I'm curious about that. We just did a survey with our employees and one of the questions we asked was, um, you know, how frequently do you feel socially isolated during the work week? Mm -hmm. And what do you do with that answer when you see it? When you see, okay, about a third of my company is struggling. Um, what role do I play um, as a business in addressing that and how can we address that? Because we know humans need an in-person connection. We can't just be all digital, but how much of that is helping to support employees to do things outside of work, find hobbies, find interests, find local clubs that are you know, of, of passion um, versus like in the work experience. And I don't have an answer, but if, if anybody who's watching or, or my fellow panelists, if you have thoughts around that, that's, that's a trend that I'm very curious about. Well, I'm super impressed that you're asking the question because, you know, that's the, the first step, isn't it? Is, is, you know, a problem shared is a problem half solved. And if we get into that bit of a model of, you know, you've got such a higher level of sophistication in the questions you're asking, then we probably had two years ago when it was basically a smile sheet. Now we're asking really questions that really matter to our employees mm -hmm. that then inform how we think about our benefit programs, how we think about our work design, um, org design. Um, there's so many different levers and nuances that go there just because you've opened the door a door mm -hmm. that, you know, and it, it was part of the uh, prep that we had here. Of, you know, we used to like block out. We just we just knew Rustin when he came in and what he looked like inside the office. Now we know Rustin. We know his two French bulldogs. We know his husband, Jeff. We know the dining room table. Oh, my God, I've got a new uh, piece of art, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> we know everything about you because we've seen it all. Um, and it's another level of intimacy that um, we, we have an opportunity there to, to treat that gift 
and that connection with our employees in a very, very, very special way. Mm -hmm. I love that. And the other, the other flip side of that is also respecting folks' boundaries, right? Ooh. Because um, two years ago, you never would know, as you mentioned, the two bulldogs or the pinter, the picture, like you would, it'd probably take years to kind of build that work friendship into, do you want to come to my home, right? Like, do you want to know my address? And so when folks don't have their camera off, or if they just choose to kind of do what they have to do, like remember that you were in their home and that's a very sacred space to a lot of people. And since we've blurred a lot of the lines over the past two years, um, there is a beautifulness of kind of seeing that. I'm surprised my eight-year-old actually hasn't bombarded this Zoom call quite yet. <laughs> um, but it, you know, meeting people's family, I think is great because you know, even at the holiday party, you couldn't have that sense of understanding. Um, but just reminding folks that it's okay for folks to kind of want to, to have a little bit of separation um, and, and, and give tools uh, to those managers to understand why, and then kind of moving forward. So work still gets done, people still feel uh, engaged proactively, um, and, and everyone feels seen and heard. So kind of wrapping all of that together um, mm -hmm. in, that one, in that one motion. I love that. Yeah, it's it's such a delicate balance of kind of it can be isolating, but it can be invasive. It's kind of this this whole balance there. Um, and so thinking a little bit more about kind of intentional inclusion, um, Christina, we had a great conversation on our pre-call um, about this. Um, so love to call on you first for this. But as we think about kind of society and how work can kind of be a microcosm of that, what role do businesses play in actively bringing people together? Yeah, I think this is new territory for a lot of organizations, not all, some are very purpose driven and, and have, you know, social issues at the heart of kind of what they do. But for a lot of more traditional organizations, this is brand new that they haven't really um, had to focus on this. But as we see the kind of the country and the world um, and this really dif dis divisive dialogue that's taking place. And then people are at home um, living in their bubble, not being um, forced to kind of bump in with people that might have different views or different experiences. Um, the rise of social media and kind of what that has looked like over the pandemic and how that was an outlet for many people, but how you start to get into a bit of an echo chamber. Um, so I, I do think that when we think about, you know, our DEI initiatives, our overall employee engagement, um, you know, how we bring people together and this truly this skill of dialogue disagreement um, and, and still working together is a mission critical skill set. Um, when we're in the workplace, we all have one common goal um, and it's, it's hopefully to live out the mission. And if that mission is something as cool as, um, you know, make dogs happy, um, that that can be a unifier. And because you've already established some common ground that we're all here because we love dogs and we love other people's dogs and we want them to be happy. Um, you can start to tackle things that have historically not been discussed in the workplace, but because we're kind of in the workplace, but also kind of in our homes, that those boundaries are so blurred that it's hard for people to switch in a way that they might've switched when they were putting on a suit and a tie or, um, their heels and their pantyhose like do people even wear pantyhose anymore like, it's a like I hope it's a dying a dying uh, fashion statement and you know getting in their car or their bike or the bus or whatever it need to go to the office place we don't have that distance anymore um, so I, I think whether or not a business wants to have that conversation take place um is le it's less of a choice. I think it's going to have to happen just because we need people to still work together. Our, as we technology gets better and better, we automate more and more. It's the collaboration. It's the squishy shit that we spend time working through. Um, and that requires trust. That requires, you know, bridge building. 
um, which is the same thing that, you know, when we look around society, like we need those same skills, you know, at, at a macro level as well. Did you say squishy shit? I sure did. <laughs> I love it. Hashtag it. Hashtag it. I, Asia, I, I yes. want to put you on point. Will you share your cold cheese pizza story? Me? Oh, now you're oh. putting me... Well, I have a thought, but let me see if it will come back yeah. to me because as, as my team knows, I'm good for a good story, but once it's out there, yeah. it's out there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> one thing that Christina just mentioned that I want to touch on, you know, so as we head into the, you know, the two year anniversary of kind of our societal and racial unrest and um, thinking about folks being decisive um, or not divisive rather, um, I find the workplace to be the place of um, continuing learn, continuous learning. A lot of us, we stop learning after high school, we stop after college or wherever you stopped. I feel like the business is the business places, the workplaces where we go and continuously learn, get new skills, mm -hmm. right? If it's Six Sigma or is it around conflict resolution, this is the space where people are going to get it because they have to. They're, they're there for the, the mission. They're also there for a paycheck. And for them to continue to receive such benefits, you have to kind of play within the rule. The Hill Holiday, we're hungry, humble humans. And we try to lend everything back to the human nature and looking at each other face to face. And so when you're thinking about some of the things um, around what's happening in society and how it comes into the workplace, it does. When someone, um, perhaps gets killed by law enforcement or there's a war. I have to come into the space and try to smile and do my job when in theory, I am so disconnected and holding a lot on my heart. And so folks really have to take time to understand that workplaces are a microcosm of society, though it feels political and I've heard the feedback that we shouldn't be talking about politics at work, but my being isn't political. Me sitting here is not a political statement. It's just my human beingness. And so uh, we really have to think about that. And as we change the lens of like, everyone has to do unconscious bias, check. How are you taking that unconscious bias workshop and making it intentionally inclusive in your day to day? How are your policies checking for unconscious bias? How are your hiring practice checking for unconscious bias? Your promotions, your performance plans, all of that's how the unconscious bias training really gets real, um, has its uh, legs and has um, folks seeing um, the long picture, the long game in some of those investments is seeing it in all the places. And so I do feel I was supposed to be a first grade teacher. I pivoted in college and here I am, but I still think there's a space for teaching and bringing folks together. And I, I do feel strongly that organizations have that, um, have that opportunity to help us move forward as a society. Mm -hmm. We, we re recently had an example of uh, one of our partners didn't maybe completely align with, um, you know, how we view society. And uh, one of our ERGs really brought this to life. And what we found, and it, it it's something that seems to work really well for us, is creating spaces very quickly where people can talk and can share what they're thinking about. We can we can also talk about what's the company about and you know where the company plays and where it doesn't play. And that doesn't mean that you know employees don't have and can't have different points of view and shouldn't have point you know different points of view. And sometimes maybe the I won't say they're not they're they're opposed to each other, but they're just on different tracks. And I think having that conversation about, okay, the company made this decision for A, B, and C, and yeah, we don't support X, Y, and Z in any stretch of the imagination. And, you know, how can we better, you know, support and educate and engage um, and create those spaces? And again, you know, going back to the rug and sweeping it under the rug, that may be what we've tried to do in the past, or, you know, this is a workplace, no conversation, you know. The humans are coming here, so let's be ready and welcoming um, as we all join. Mm -hmm. Rustin, what was the pizza piece? Because now folks want to know, and I don't recall. Were you an edu uh, sorry, an elected official? I am. I was. Okay. And did you work the polls? 
Yes. Oh, that's what it was. I loved that story. <laughs> and I just did like, and then I'm sitting here in my mind, I'm thinking, oh my God, I've, you know, COVID, uh, COVID brain. I, I've fogged out. I've missed something up. Uh, but I just, I love that. So tell it because it is Sorry, so good. Yes. Yes. Context insider, everybody. Now you're in a little <laughs> huddle here. So what we were talking about, I was an elected official in my town for six years. And when we were talking about that divisiveness and having people come together and how we've encouraged folks to say, you know, to your point, if I'm purple or green or fuchsia or magenta, right? Whatever the colors folks had is really encouraging our talent to get involved civically, full stop. Go, go be a, coal, a poll worker and go you know, volunteer for a committee. And that's where the cold pizza is. When you're looking at someone across the table and they're eating the same cold pizza at four o'clock at the polls, you're doing something together to better the community. Regardless of someone votes yay or nay, you've built that community and you've had an opportunity to make an impact in your neighborhood, in your town, in your ward, versus kind of going up and thinking about elections or people or politics every four years, every two years, an election most likely happens in your town every year. And so from like an EDNIB perspective of having folks feel that they're included in the conversation, if there is such a dichotomy of folks feeling one way or the other, it's bringing it down to what we're even doing is exercising our, our civic uh, engagement and really having the opportunity to use those rights in the right way. So that's mm -hmm. what, um, that was kind of the place of being intentionally um, inclusive and finding that common ground across the board. So thank you, Rustin. And that was a good story. I should put the, I should write that down next time. You should <laughs> write it down. Absolutely. I, I, well, I just connected with it. So, because I was like, oh, that's just, that just humans again, coming together as humans and not saying that we all have to, you know, be educated and have the same views or anything like that, but that we're ready and willing and able to listen. Mm -hmm. I love that. I'm glad you brought that up, Rustin, because I love that story too. So it was a good one to share. Um, so kind of thinking about, you know, these difficult topics or, or things that people want to raise at work. Um, sometimes there can be fear of retaliation or of bias, things like that. Um, so would love to hear from you, Aisha, on kind of where anonymous feedback comes to play, because there's obviously lots of ways for employees to give feedback directly one-to-one. -one. Um, managers, things like that, but how, how can you kind of leverage anonymous feedback and why is that important? Sure. So we use All Voices as an organization we have for the past couple of years, and it just gives folks another avenue to be able to be heard, and sometimes what they're saying is uncomfortable. It is squishy, um, and they're not fully comfortable to lend themselves to what they're saying, you know, as in fear of those things, which they will never, they shouldn't ever happen. Retaliation shouldn't happen in the workplace. If someone is, you know, behaving in those ways, there's other actions that should be taking place. But it does give folks that safe, um, that safe space to go ahead and say what's on their mind, say what they're thinking, how they're feeling. Um, what we're something that we're implementing this year is we as a holding company do a huge uh, engagement survey at the end of every year. And where we um, as a team, a talent team, we're looking at where we could have been doing better and doing pulse surveys on those spaces as we, to, as we heard and we listened, we made a plan to engage and how to fix it. And now we're gonna pulse check and ensure that we're making those changes. And folks don't have to, that larger survey is anonymous and the ones that we'll do quarterly will also be anonymous, but I think it gives some freeing, um, a freeing space for folks to just say what they want to say. And I know some, you know, some folks like, oh, they can look at the IP address, know that I don't know how, and I never would <laughs> figure out those kind of cybersecurity spaces. This is completely anonymous. We have no ways of finding things out. And we try to share that in another space that we ensured that our uh, talent and we had ambassadors know about um, our in anonymous surveys through the tool is our business resource groups. Rustin, you mentioned how they bring so many things to light. It, those are spaces of communities coming together and they sometimes don't know where to, to send their feedback to the BRG leader or once the BRG leader has it, they don't know where to go with it. So we've been, we've empowered all of them. They've, they've sat through learnings um, to how to use the tool. And I think it's just so powerful, so powerful to ensure that all folks kind of have the tools and the access to understanding how it's used, wh what we do with the feedback. Again, there's no retaliation, really communicating the purpose, the gift of feedback and what they're giving us to make us a stronger, more nimble, better organization. And so that's what we've been doing. And I think it's so important for us to take those, those learnings, sit with them, reflect, and then make changes. So 
feedback in any form is um, great, but giving folks another anonymous way has been super helpful for us. Mm -hmm. I, I, we've all worked in companies where you didn't have that outlet for anonymous feedback, unless it was super bad and then you're going down a whistleblower and you know, you're know you in a whole different kettle of fish. Um, and I, I find it so refreshing that you have that ability to have have a dialogue, um, you know, meeting someone where they are. So they're, you know, may not be comfortable with their manager, their manager's manager or going to the HR team or what have you, but they are comfortable having a bit of a dialogue online. And, um, you know, you can get so much richer information than you can on a scale from one to 10. How do you rate A or B or C um, in these little moments of openness? Now the art is in the question. Um, and um, you know, sometimes we do just simple ones of like, what's the best thing that's happened to you this month? And uh, you know, or what's one thing that you'd, if you could uh, wave your magic wand, what would be one thing that you would think about in the future? Be prepared for the answer, um, but you can get some wonderful, interesting insight as you go through. Mm -hmm. I love this. And, I, and sometimes, you know, you may have somebody who's new to the company where they just haven't built trust yet, or they have baggage from a previous experience where trust was broken or they saw it mm -hmm. for other people. So, you know, mission step one in your mission here is make it safe for people to give feedback. And that's what anonymous feedback does is that it lowers the risk um, in people participating actively in co what I say is, you know, employees are co-authors in their work experience, mm -hmm. right? So it lets them be a co-author in it and, and actually have a voice, um, and, and share what's going on. Um, ultimately our hope, my hope always when I'm engaging back and forth with people on all voices is that I get somebody who will, um, you know, uh, be comfortable reaching out to me in real life. Um, Cause sometimes I'll see questions and I'll be like, wow, why does that person feel like it needs to be anonymous? It feels like a low risk question. Maybe it's a piece mm. of product feedback or whatever it is. So I'm always watching that piece too. And some of it may be that it just happens to be the tool that's the easiest and most accessible for them. And they don't have connections to other people in the business. So whatever the reason is, I'm glad they're at least there. And we hope that we can build enough trust and enough skills for people to have more conversations directly, but we always have this safety net where everybody can play. Um, and we use, we use all voices on a really frequent basis. So we hold um, all company meetings about once a month. Before those meetings, we solicit questions um, from the company. They come in via that format. Well, we answer most of them, I would say. Well, there's a little bit of like, does this actually apply to the whole company or is this a very specific question? But all the questions get answered, whether in the system or in that full, um, uh, that full meeting. And then we have now started doing um, feedback after those all companies with a pulse survey that says, you know, just a couple of different questions that we're tracking on our engagement survey as well. So we can get that real time feedback and people feel like they're dancing with us and participating because again, we can't see their faces um, as they're tuning in. So, um, yeah, I think it, you have to start here. I, I think a lot of people aspire of like, I wish people would just tell me directly to my face, but there could be a whole host of reasons that's blocking people um, from getting to that point. So start, start there and build from it. I love that, awesome. Um, and so kind of thinking now about retention and kind of employer brand. So we've talked a lot about kind of building that culture internally. Um, uh, Rustin, I'll come to you on this one. How can companies kind of think of showcasing that culture, um, you know, on an external level or standing out as an, as an attractive employer uh, for, for candidates? Just a 
multi-billion dollar question in that. Um, you know, I, I'll go back to the, the example that I'm living uh, here with BART and, um, you know, being very clear about what your company is about. And uh, we're lucky in, in that, that we had brilliant founders 10 plus years ago who set out a simple mission and we've been following through on it. Um, I would encourage you that if, if you think about your mission of your company or how you describe your company, and it's not something that excites you and maybe gives you a couple of butterflies in your tummy, it might be time to rethink about how you position and how you think about the way you describe your company and the way you describe working there. Um, and that it's unique, that it's specific, that it's real, um, and that you can bring to life uh, for people. And when I say that it's real, none of us think that it's gonna be real 100% of the time but it's certainly what you aspire to be real for your company and that you can find those moments of truth that, that really iterate it. And that's been the most powerful for us. And I won't say that, you know, cat lovers aren't welcome, um, but, you know, that appreciation and that understanding of what we're about, that we're going to be a bit fun, we're going to be a bit quirky, it's going to be a bit creative in, in nature. If you want super structured, if you want very operationally focused, if you want uber professionalized um, suits, ties, may not be the place for you. And that's completely fine. We want you to be uber successful wherever you go and whatever you do. But if you come here, you're going to be successful in making dogs happy. Christina or Asia, how, how what would you build on? <laughs> oh, that was great. You know, the great re resignation, reimagination, the great, re you know, great and then an R word, whatever you want to call it. It's been real. And I think talent more than ever, as we were talking about having teams all over the country, um, talent more than ever, because the office is not about, can you commute there? The office is, do you have strong enough Wi-Fi to click into the Zoom room? And so mm. folks definitely have an opportunity to kind of go beyond their wild, wildest dreams, quite frankly. They're not stuck in a 25 mile radius. And so when you're thinking about retention in your employer brand, it is going back to who, you know, what we are and who, who we are and what we do. And then it's about treating folks with respect and having psychologically safe spaces. Cause we've seen in different studies, Christina, you mentioned different um, things that have already been, case studies have already been proven. Some folks are willing to take a pay cut to be in spaces that are all the other things that they need to make them feel whole. Mm -hmm. And so you have to really think through that. It's not just about salary. It's about a host of other things that were kind of put in the squishy soft areas, like nice to have, but they're need to have now. Folks are, they're not commuting. They're having time back to have dinner with their families. They're having time to knit or, uh, you know, see friends more frequently. And it's, those are some things that we're just not willing to give up for, a, you know, a nine to five. And so as folks are really trying to ensure that they're retaining their best talent, attracting the best talent is really having that human aspect of what what are we what are we giving our people? Why do they want to stay here? What the investment is going to look like long term? And then the, you know to your point, then they can start to make decisions. But I think that's going to be huge in the retention space is really finding out why people want to stay. Mm -hmm. I love that. And there's this alignment of like, are you actually walking the talk, right? So what you espouse as your values, how real are they for you know an employee on a day-to-day -day perspective? And if you're not sure the answer to that, you should you know use your all voices and do a pulse check <laughs> and exactly. track it and say where do we have blind spots and go after it. And, and I also think that you know there is some component of this that is unavoidable for whatever reason. And it may with the resignation piece. And I say that because I think some people just need a fresh start, a clean slate. So there may not even be anything wrong, um, you know, with where they are, but they're burnt, they're fried, and they need something new and fresh. And I think um, being okay with some of that turnover happening as well and not um, and respecting that for your employees too. 
um, that, you know, the trauma of the past two years for some people, they're just at their breaking point. Um, so, you know, I think trying to figure out who you are, what your values are, how closely are you actually living them on a day-to-day -day basis and knowing that people are going to do the math and the math may look different for them than who you are. And that's okay. Um, and it may have nothing to do with that. It may just be that some people just need a, need a beat um, to kind of reassess and, and uh, a clean slate to move forward, so. Yeah. Love that. Awesome. Well, we're coming up on time, but I have one final question uh, where I would love for everyone to, to uh, respond, but we can do kind of a speed round of what is one thing um, that you hope employers and employees, anyone listening in today um, takes away from this conversation. And we'll start with Aisha. If, um, and if there's any questions that folks have for us, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll see if we can type really quickly. Um, really about being intentional. This, this sense of you know diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging belongs to the people teams or the talent teams or the HR team. It's everyone's work. And so as you go through and you talk to your teammates and you're creating that psychologically safe space, and you know, there's a lot of buzzwords that I'm saying here. So note that I and seeing that and hearing that, but there are full practices in those words. And so really being intentional about those things, I think is huge. And if, and if you don't feel that it's happening, raise your hand, give the feedback, let folks know that we're missing the mark to Christina's point. If your company is toting that they're an easy work from home, but you're working 15 hours a day, then there has to, something is fundamentally broken. And so ensuring that you're holding folks accountable and you're sharing that feedback, will go back to the intentional pieces and then things can start to change. I'll give mine. Squishy shit matters. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, Rustin. <laughs> but it is true, you know, we, we think about these matters and thank God for tools like we're just, you know, we've shared today. They give us some way of tracking and heat mapping and sensing um, and gaining insights to where we can then uh, take action. Um, but oftentimes our actions are going to be conversations. Um, oftentimes our, our actions are going to be, um, you know, steps that we're going to take um, and they're not going to be, you know, we'll change the wall blue from red. Mm -hmm. I guess the one thing that I'd leave people with is don't let perfect get in the way of progress here. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, if you're in a decision making seat, awesome. Um, maybe you don't have the resources, that's okay. If you're not in a decision-making seat, you still can um, have an impact and start with one question, start with one action and see where that goes. And it will lead you down a path that will hopefully help support more of that proactive engagement. It doesn't have to be this big, huge effort. It could be as simple as, you know, some of the great questions that Rustin shared of like, what's one great thing that happened to you in the last month or, you know, wave a magic wand, what's one thing that you would change or would you recommend this as a great place to work or do you have a friend at work like that's actually a really powerful question that mm -hmm. Gallup uses. Um, so just start with one thing, learn from that, ask seven more questions from that and get really, really curious and then keep going and you'll see progress. It doesn't happen overnight, but demonstrating um, genuine curiosity, you'll start to build trust with your employees. I love that. I love that Gartner question. I feel like I have new friends today. So yeah. I feel engaged. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, we're right on time. This was such an amazing conversation. I feel like we have so many great takeaways um, to take from this. Uh, so thank you so much to the panelists for, for today's conversation. And thank you all so much for joining today. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Bye.